everybody. So welcome to the FCAS A Catch Word Winners um, presentations uh, on the Save the Meniscus, right? So I'm Patrick Young, right? Um, the Honorary Secretary of FCAS, right? Well, despite we cannot have face-to-face -face meetings uh, over the past few months because of COVID-19, uh, the FCAS and the Eight Cat Group are very devoted to continue educations and communications to all the Asian friends, right? So that we run this webinar um, for our friends in Asia, right? Um, chairing this webinar with me will be my good friends, uh, Chana Kang, uh, the president of uh, FCAS with me. So Chana Kang, your turn. Microphone. Uh, hope everyone is doing good. Uh, before we start, uh, I would like to announce one news that a uh, very sad news for us. Two days ago, Professor Feng Huo from China passed away due to the, uh, this heart uh, condition. So this is a very sad news for us. And before we start the, uh, the webinar, I would like to take uh, this opportunity to show some memorable time uh, from him. Uh, Patrick, would you, would you mind to show that, please? Um, so as mentioned by Chana Khan, our very good friends, our brothers, um, Professor Feng Hua from Jesus and Beijing Hospitals, um, left us about two days ago, right? So um, in the memory of him, so within a very short time, um, uh, we have created a very short video clips um, about our, our good friends uh, regarding his contributions of um, and participations of um, the surface of uh, knee arthroscopy surgeries in Asia. So I'm going to share with you a video, right? Um, let me see. So, uh, dear friends, um, Epcast and ACAT will have a more memorable surface and uh, for our great friends, our great knee giant, Professor Feng Huai in, um, in short futures, right? So uh, let's go back to our webinar, right? Uh, today, I would like to introduce to you our webinar panelists, right? Our topic today is a safe the meniscus repair, reconstruct and replacement, right? Today we have um, our friends from India and also a big guns from uh, Korea, right? We are going to start with uh, Dr. Sachin Tapaswi, 
and then followed by our great mentors. Uh, many of us learn from him, Professor An Jing Huan, right, from Korea, and then followed by Professor Lee Sang Hak, and then uh, Professor Wang Jung Ho, and finally is Professor Kim Jing Ku, right. Um, we are going to take questions um, from those uh, attendees who are particip participating in this webinar. Um, please go to the um, Q&A box and drop down your questions, right? And then Chana Khan and I will collect all the questions and pick up some representative questions and then we'll ask the panelists uh, in the discussion sections after all of them presenting their lectures, right? Is that okay? Yeah. So um, I'm going to turn the controls over to the first speaker, Dr. Sachin Tapasri. So Sachin, are you ready? Perfect. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, again, at the outset, uh, we're going to miss you, Dr. Fong Hua. We had very fond memories when he was visiting India last year as a faculty on an e-course. And we had the opportunity for him to share in our publication uh, and our textbook as well. Okay, the topic for today, I will start off by discussing how do we repair a bucket handle of the medial meniscus. And I'll mainly be focusing on the technical tips and not so much on the various results reported in literature, because those are something that you know all of us can go to very easily and uh, look at the same again. So why do we need to save the meniscus? Is because we want to prevent this increased peak contact force which happens after a meniscectomy and then leads to rapid progressing arthritis in the knee joint. So the indication to repair a bucket handle of the medial meniscus would be a tear which is in the peripheral zone, either zone zero or zone one. It should present to us early, preferably within the first four to six weeks. We should have a young adult in whom the healing rates can be as high as 80%. And of course, after doing a big repair, we should have someone who has good compliance. And if we have an associated ACL tear, we all know that the healing rates are better because of all the bone marrow elements that do come out. So there are three things which are essential when you repair a meniscus, more so when you repair a large meniscus, and those very easily can be sort of put down as A, B, and C. So A is anatomic reduction, which is absolutely critical. We want to have the meniscus that has been repaired and that's why for the same, we need to visualize the meniscus pretty nicely as well. We want to do biological augmentation of the meniscus. And last, you want to have good compression sutures to hold your reduced meniscus firmly so that nature takes over and starts healing itself properly and adequately. To do a proper reduction, you need to have good exposure. And for this, there is a very fantastic technique, which is the MCL pie crusting. So you do pie crusting, control pie crusting of the MCL with an 18 gauge needle, either proximally or distal to the joint line. And by using this technique, you can very safely improve the exposure within the knee, which will then allow you to put your sutures in properly. And of course, reduce a meniscus, which may seem to be irreducible. So we start off by palpating the joint line. And as you go in with your 18 gauge needle and slowly start pie crusting the area, in the region of the superficial MCL and the PUL insertion with the knee near full extension, you'll find that gradually the joint space opens up and it may open up almost to the tune of four, three to four millimeters. This is a very good technique, which I will encourage all of us to use when we start doing meniscus repairs, because it allows us to essentially visualize properly, reduce the meniscus, and then of course, pass good sutures. The second thing which is important is that we need to do either or of all of these methods of doing biological augmentation. Rasping is probably the easiest of them and you have a special designed diamond rasp and you should not only use this rasp on the meniscal tissue, but you should also rasp the synovium as well. The whole purpose of doing rasping is to increase the vascularity and to create a healing response and rasping the synovium both superior and more so the inferior of the meniscus is pretty important. The next thing which is very critical is to create vascular access channels. And these can be done either by using a microfracture hook probe or 
the easiest thing to do is to take one of the inside out needles and go ahead and make multiple perforations in the area of the meniscus that you want to repair, which will then allow vascular channels to go through. If you're doing a concomitant ACL reconstruction, you make large tunnels, both in the femur and the tibia, and all the marrow elements can come out and you know they can help with, with all the growth factors and all the MSCs. But in case you are doing an isolated meniscus repair, then it's always a very good idea to use a microfracture all and do marrow stimulation and create multiple holes in the area of the lateral intercondylar notch, which is devoid of the attachments of the ACL. This is a very important step and you know, doing the same can improve your healing rates by almost over 20 to 30%. Last but not the least, you can also use a fibrin clot, which will act like you know, a chemotactic and a mitogenic stimulus. And you can push this preformed fibrin clot within the meniscus tear and hold it down with the help of sutures, or you may choose to use a PRP clot as well, which has been also described well in literature. The third step, which is very important, is to use compression sutures. Now, what's important to understand is that because of the arrangement of the fibers of the meniscus, which are circumferential, it is important that we repair the meniscus at right angles to these fibers, which means that ideally you should have vertical mattress sutures and these should alternate on the superior and the inferior surface of the meniscus because in doing so, it will allow you to grab all the areas of the meniscus which are torn and thereby prevent any form of booking open of the meniscus on one surface. It's useful to remember to use two zero diameter sutures because they don't create huge holes in the meniscus and preferably always use non-absorbable sutures if you may to allow the meniscus to stay firmly compressed. What technique do we use? You need to be aware of all techniques and essentially the traditional teaching was that on the medial side the posterior third was best treated with the all inside technique. The mid third area or the mid third zone was best treated with the inside out and the anterior third was best treated with the outside in. But with the advent of better inside out cannulas, now the inside out suturing technique can very easily sort of cover more area of the meniscus and by making a safety incision either posterior medial for the medial side or posterior lateral for the lateral side, you are able to encompass a larger area of meniscus repair with the use of the inside out technique. So the patient that we have has a large meniscus tear on the medial side and you want to put in sutures at least about three to four millimeters away from each other. We don't have a definite answer as yet as to how far the sutures need to be placed, but logic tells us that they should not be away more than four millimeters from each other. And then we're going to be using a variety of suturing techniques for the far posterior third area. We'd we'll probably use the all inside technique using the various commercially available devices. Majority of our meniscus will be repaired using the inside out technique. And then we'll use the outside in technique for the far anterior suture configuration. For the inside out technique, we use these flexible swathe needles as they are called and they're flexible made of nitinol probably, and they are connected to a loop of suture, which is 2-0 high strength suture, which allows us to carry out this repair. You have a variety of cannulas that are available. You can have the single lumen or the double lumen one. The single lumen ones have some limitation in the amount of area that they can cover owing to their shape. But more recently, with the advent of the zone specific cannulas, you are now able to cover almost all the area of the meniscus by having special cannulas which will take care of the anterior third, the mid third area, or even almost reaching up to the posterior third. So the zone specific cannulas have made life a lot more simpler and the use of them has definitely increased our suturing capacity. When you're dealing with tears which, which you want to encompass and want to go really posterior, I would encourage you to make a safety incision. This incision is may placed on the medial side, which is slightly posterior to the uh, vertical length of the MCL. You open up the fascia and then you put a spoon behind or any form of protecting device in between the medial head of the gastrocnemius and the capsule 
and this allows your suture or needles to deflect out without any risk of impaling any of the important structures on the back of the knee. So let's look at a case example here. Here we have a locked medial meniscus. As you see here, the first step that you want to do is to do pie thrusting of the MCL. By doing so, you want to then also look at all the various other pathologies which are there. And then you want to see what zone it is in. So in spite of having a tonic on, there is good vascularity. And after making pie crusting of the MCL, there is improved uh, space on the medial side of the knee and you can very easily then reduce the meniscus. Just like how you temporarily fix a fracture with a K-wire before you bring on your final uh, sort of plate fixation, I would like to use the same principle here. And my first suture is a reduction suture with a single straight cannula, which is used from the contralateral portal and by the use of this cannula, I can reduce the meniscus, I can judge its reducibility, and then I pass my first stitch, which is a 2-0 inside out suture, exactly at the area where the meniscus curves, somewhat in the area of the POL, which then allows me to reduce or keep this meniscus reduced, as I may say so, so that we can then go ahead and complete the further repair without having any form of concern of the meniscus slipping when we are doing a surgery. So that forms a very important step. You want to look at your first stitch, which is going to be somewhat like a reduction stitch, as if you may call it. And then the assistant can just give traction on this particular suture while the meniscus stays reduced throughout the rest of the procedure. Then you'd want to go ahead, put a series of sutures, starting from either from the middle of the tear to go posterior or anterior. And then what we've done here first is that we've taken now the all inside device and we've started repairing the back of the knee. So it's completely your choice whether you want to start in the middle and then extend posterior or go anterior. It depends exactly on the personality of the meniscus tear. I usually prefer to first fix the middle, have the meniscus sitting properly, then go to the back and then put all my sutures in. I of course know of a lot of surgeon friends and colleagues who like to start anteriorly and then work themselves posteriorly. It's just a matter of preference as to how you do the same. But what is important to understand whether you go from front to back or back to front is to importantly keep your sutures alternating on the superior and the inferior surface. And here it is important that we use not a straight type of all inside device, but a reverse type, type of an all inside device, which will allow you to safely put stitches on the under surface of the meniscus. There are a variety of devices available on the market now through various companies. All of them have their own advantages, but I think in a sense, they work in the same way. They allow you to place sutures very safely and very securely without any risk of disruption or dislodgement. It's important that whenever you put your stitches down, you want to go back to the knee and see that you've closed the gap on the back of the knee. You don't want to have a false sense of security and then you know be sort of caught up that you're not done a proper repair. So you want to ensure that you've taken care of uh, the meniscotibial junction properly and then go ahead and put your sutures in. Once you're happy and you're safe that all your meniscus is safely secure, now you come to the front or the anterior part of the knee and a useful technique for doing an outside in stitch is to actually put a hook probe in the area where you want to pass your outside in stitches, palpate the hook probe subcutaneously in this particular manner so that you know exactly where to bring your needle in. And I found find this technique to be pretty useful. Otherwise with the outside in technique, many a times you are struggling to find which would be the exact area to put your suture in properly. So you can go in now with your outside in suture. You need to have uh, two large wide bore cannulas. You can also turn off the OR lights and look at trans illumination. That is another good technique. You turn off all the lights in the operating theater, do trans illumination uh, to, by keeping the telescope exactly at the area where you want the sutures to come through. And that is also another useful trick for us to use when we are doing an outside in the repair. You then want to come in 
with your two needles, which are going to be 16 gauge needles. Many a times I will use the suture, which I use in the all inside device. So the suture that you have, uh, which remains uh, sort of which you cut off after you've deployed the anchor, that is a good 2 high strength suture, which can be very conveniently used for doing the outside in suturing technique as well. So you put two needles, uh, one more posterior, the other more anterior, and then by putting a snare through the needle that is anterior, you come in with a small curved uh, mosquito hemostat or any form of grasping device, pass it uh, through this particular snare or this uh, grasping device, hold on to the suture, which is there posteriorly, retrieve it out of your portal. And then all you have to do is to retrieve both the sutures, uh, retrieve both the needles out posteriorly, taking care that you'll first take the needle out, which contains the suture, and then you'll take the needle out, which contains the snare. By doing so, all that you need to do now is to make an incision on the needle side, dissect down to the capsule, and then tie your sliding suture knots. So depending upon, again, the size of the tear, you'll place the appropriate number of sutures um, exactly as you may require. Another technique which I'm demonstrating here for doing an outside end repair is to actually pass the posterior needle through the snare and then just grab on the suture completely. So various ways to do the outside end repair by using a variety of uh, sort of uh, surgical techniques which is possible. And uh, in a sense, I think the principles remain the same. You want to get good compression sutures, which are, should be alternating on the superior and on the inferior surface. Once you've achieved this, the next thing that you'd want to do is to make an incision on the skin, do very good dissection, ensure that you, know, you are dissecting down, right down to the capsule, and then you take your sutures one by one, pair them, and then use any form of a sliding knot. Here your su shoulder suturing techniques come in very handy and they will allow you to sort of go down completely and ensure that you have a very good repair. After you've completed tying your knots, it's always a good idea to go back in and scope. If you see any prominent uh, devices like the all inside device, which is seen protruding here, I would want that to come out because I know that it will scratch the cartilage and any form of uh, sutures which may have gone loose, it is a good time now to revise them because the last thing that you'd want to ensure or you'd want to have is a device which is not mechanically sound. So in a nutshell, this is how you would go ahead technically of repairing a torn medial meniscus by using all the various techniques. You need to be well versed with all the techniques, namely the inside out, outside in and all inside and you need to definitely have good exposure and then you can complete your final surgical procedure. How do you do rehab then? Well, for large bucket handle meniscus tears, I restrict flexion to about 90 degrees for the first three weeks and then allow full range of motion. I, I, I keep them non-weight bearing or partial weight bearing depending upon the associated pathology for three weeks and then allow them to do full weight bearing. I keep them in a long knee brace for three weeks and then put them in an ACL brace for about two months and they're allowed cycling and gym uh, only after two months where they progressively increase their range. So to conclude, it's important that we should choose the correct patient. We need to have good exposure in the form of pie crusting so that we can reduce our tear properly. We need to do biological augmentation. You should use at least more than two techniques in every knee. You need to have good compression sutures using vertical mattress 2O high strength sutures alternating on the superior and the inferior side. And of course, you don't want to spoil your result if you don't do a careful rehab. I thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to present the technique on bucket handle meniscus tear repair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sachin. Right. Um, so, um, well, I have already jotted down the questions for you. So, we, but I will come back to you later in the Q&A sections, right? Thank you. All right. So the next speaker is, uh, without a further need of introductions, is Professor An Jing Huan. Uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of you attending this webinar is indeed uh, learn a lot of skills in meniscus repair as well as uh, ligament reconstruction from Professor Ang, uh, previously working at Samsung Medical Center, right? 
So he's really like the mentors and the godfather in meniscus surgery in Asia, I would say. So today is our greatest honor to have him to join us in this webinar, right? And uh, his topic is about how to deal with middle meniscus posterior horizontal tear. So Professor An, would you like to share your screen? Thank you. Sachin, please uh, unshare your screen, right? Yeah, it's unshared. Very good. Okay, thank you. Please start. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it is great honor for me to be here. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Patrick. My topic is how to deal with middle meniscus posterior horizontal tear. This is my disclosure. So middle meniscus posterior horizontal tear are degenerative tear occur commonly in middle-aged or old persons frequently associated with osteoarthritis. Arthroscopic partial meniscectomy over degenerative uh, meniscal tear is one of the most commonly performed orthopedic procedure around the world. However, the outcome after arthroscopic partial meniscectomy for degenerative uh, medial meniscus tear was not superior to conservative treatment or same surgeries. So, however, uh, therefore, ESCA uh, meniscus consensus recommended arthroscopic partial meniscectomy should not be performed as a first-line treatment. Recommend uh, conservative treatment for three months. In indication for early arthroscopic partial meniscectomy may depend on patient presenting mechanical symptom. But actually, clinically, mechanical symptom is sometimes it is very difficult to identify them. So I would like to uh, how to deal with the middle meniscus posterior uh, horizontal tear uh, as indication how to select operative treatment uh, during partial meniscectomy, how much meniscus we have to remove. I like to preserve the peripheral limb. This uh, peripheral limb is maybe spontaneous. We can see the spontaneous healings. The other one, in, in young patient, I like to show you the arthroscopic all inside the circumference suture technique. On examinations, knee is a full extended, full fractured position, internal or external rotation. We can feel the click and pain and joint line. Is uh, click is caused by unstable or uh, horizontal tear or associated flap tears. Uh, so MRI is uh, highly accurate in diagnosing meniscus, especially is horizontal tear. In the linear line is divide the meniscus superior and inferior rib. In diagnosing uh, MRIs, we in the two slice touch rule. This means uh, con consequent two slice show the meniscal tear. We can diagnose uh, M uh, meniscal tear. It is showing typical uh, middle meniscus posterior tear. And we have to differentiate uh, the horizontal tears grade two and grade three. Grade two means the uh, so horizontal line is limited in sub meniscal substance. It's not extended to the joint line. It's uh, clinical is not significant. Grade three is uh, horizontal line is extended to the so joint line. It's uh, clinically significant. So, and, and for this patient, in left side is the same knee joint. This at the first, I saw this uh, horizontal line is limited in meniscal substance. So uh, I think it's a grade two. I recommend it to conservative treatment. But uh, this patient visited again two, about uh, two years later. The uh, see the symptom is aggravated and same knee joint uh, MRI shows um, more aggressive uh, worsen uh, horizontal tear and arthroscopic uh, views, we can see the joint uh, horizontal tear is connected to the joint line. We need the arthroscopic partial meniscectomy. So uh, when conservative treatment, this patient has also horizontal tear and the flap tear, but this patient ages so 80 years. So I recommend conservative treatment, even though he complains 
um, pain. With operative treatment, I like to the horizontal tear is associated with the prep tear. This is prep tear is a cause of mechanical symptom, so I recommend it to arthroscopy partial meniscectomy. It's a, the other type of a prep tear. The prep tear is a folded in medial cutter. It's very tight space. Patient complains severe pain, and we can see the bony change is a, by a prep, a prep tear. And is a sagittal view. We can see the prep and the uh, Baker cyst is also associated. A uh, prep tear is a uh, hidden uh, inferior joint line. Is we should uh, find out. And during partial meniscectomy, I like to use uh, the suture hook and the traction with uh, uh, PDS. We can very nicely uh, remove the, this prep. Uh, the other prep tear is a superior uh, limb is uh, moved to the posteriorly is indicated to partial meniscectomy. Displaced the posterior compartment of the flap. You cannot see the from anterior portal. We have to make the posterior medial portal can see it. Sometimes two posterior medial portal is needed to for partial meniscectomy. Uh, six months after operations, uh, follow-up MRI showed the very remain uh, pre saved the meniscus and the good healing. Uh, the other uh, indication is a uh, horizontal tear is associated with a meniscal schist. We can see the meniscal schist is here, the horizontal tear. And sometimes multiple uh, schist is uh, located uh, posterior along the posterior horn. This uh, schist is we cannot uh, see the from anterior portal. As uh, through arthroscope is uh, inserted uh, through anterior medial portal and reach to the posterior medial compartment as using with 970 degree scope, we can see very nicely uh, this, uh, these uh, multiple cysts, uh, we can remove it. And uh, the other central portion of the cyst uh, can be seen from the posterior medial portals. We removed all of the meniscal cyst. After then, uh, partial meniscectomy was performed. Doing partial meniscectomy, I like to preserve the peripheral limb. We can see the on MRI, this inferior limb is preserved. So one year after operation, follow-up MRI showed the very nicely healed of horizontal tears, spontaneously healed uh, without repairs. It's another example of so horizontal tear, typical horizontal tear and the prep tear and the partial meniscectomy. And this 18 months after operation, follow up MRI showed the very completely healed of a posterior horn. And uh, this patient has also horizontal tear and the double or flap tear, uh, arthroscopy partial meniscectomy were performed. Uh, so after operation, two years and five months, follow up MRI showed there remain uh, so horizontal tear. Uh, so, so I uh, defined that this is so incomplete healings. I follow up uh, three, uh, 35 knees, a uh, follow up MRI study. The uh, so average the interval of average MRI was uh, taken so one year after operations. I found the complete healings in 27 knees, it's 77%. Spawn complete healing can be occurs without repairs. Uh, incomplete healing three uh, knees. New tears occurred in one knee. As meniscal repair for horizontal tear in young patient, actually, so repair for horizontal tear is not good indicate, uh, indicated because the horizontal tear has a poor healing potential and it is difficult to uh, repair technique. But recently, some author reported us about horizontal tear repair, especially Japanese uh, Kamimura. Uh, he reported the uh, horizontal tear fixed with a fast fix. Uh, he reported 70% of complete healings uh, confirmed by second arthroscope. Uh, the Korean doctor, Dr. An, is not missed. Another famous Korean. Uh, knee surgeons, he reported almost the same uh, result uh, after the repair of horizontal tear. And also recently, all inside the circumferential shooter technique is reported. 
Uh, this patient is a 58-year-old uh, female. Uh, he visited me after meniscal repair uh, uh, at the other hospital. Uh, he, she complained that she severe pain and the swelling after meniscal repair. I did a re-operation. We can see the arthroscopic findings. Uh, previously, a uh, horizontal tear repaired with a fast fix. We can see the fast fix cut through the meniscus, and the other portion is more damaged. Because horizontal tear is a degenerative tear, is a meniscus is a very fragile, so the fast fix is not adequate uh, for repairs of these horizontal tears, in my opinion. So I like to use uh, observable PDS. As you can see, the spinal laser is inserted at the middle body, uh, put into the uh, joint, and the PDS is passed through the need, uh, spinal leader. And the spinal leader is uh, pulled out to the uh, meniscal capsular junction and reinsert with the same spinal leader with the PDS. It's the same inserted into the joint just below the meniscus. And the PDS is pulled out through the anterior medial portal. Two portal is pulled out anterior medial portal, and the sliding SMC ties. We can see the all inside the suture is repaired to the horizontal tear, and the posterior horn tears. Uh, spinal leader is inserted through the posterior medial corner. This is the posterior medial portal to just lateral to the uh, posterior medial portal. Percutaneously insert spinal. Uh, spinal leader and the PDS path through is pulled out through the anterior medial portal. After the then spinal leader is pulled back to the meniscal capsular junction. In the same spinal leader with just PDS is come out posterior medial joint arthroscope is inserted through the posterior medial portal and the pull out this uh, PDS and all inside the shooter technique tie is here. We can see the Horizontal tear is a very nice. It's uh, fixed with a circumferential uh, suture. Uh, this patient is a 34 years old male. He has a various deformed knee. Uh, various angle is eight degree, and we can see the horizontal tear and the flap tears. And this is a horizontal tear, and also medical assist is uh, posterior medial uh, or posterior horn. Uh, so, so I did uh, arthroscopic surgery. Yes, horizontal, we can see the horizontal tear, this horizontal tear, and this is prep tear, this is prep tear. Again, it, this is caused by mechanical symptom. And to remove uh, the baker, uh, associated with the meniscal cyst, so arthroscopy is reached to the posterior medial compartment and the removal to uh, this assist after arthroscopic partial meniscectomy was done. And the tail site is shaved with a saving. After then, spinal laser is inserted percutaneously at the mid body portion. And the spinal uh, PDS is pulled out through the anterior medial portal and fixed. After then, spinal laser and the P same PDS is reinserted into the joint and also catch the imperial part of the PDS and pull out to the, through the anterior medial portal. And the confirms us the no soft tissue impingement after SMC sliding tie. Uh, we can fix the, the horizontal tear is all inside the repair. And the posterior one, for the spinal leader is inserted the posterior medial posterior corner. Spine same, uh, very similar. So spinal PDS inserted and pull out to the anterior medial portal. Arthroscope reached to the posterior medial compartment. Sometimes I like to change the 70 degree scope. We can reinsert the spinal leader with a PDS. The PDS is pulled out through the posterior medial portal. Uh, after then, anterior end of PDS is uh, pulled back to the posterior compartment, the posterior medial compartment.
uh, arthroscope is uh, reached to the posterior medial compartment, uh, pull out both ends of PDS to the posterior medial portal through the same portal as SMC sliding ties, we fixed the, the horizontal tear. Tie. And so you can see the horizontal tear is fixed with four vertical sutures, replaced all inside the technique without the make posterior medial portal. And the follow up the MRI, we can see the previous cyst is disappeared. The tear site is very firmly fixed the two day after operation. Here's another example. We, I fixed the all inside the suture technique. The horizontal tear is a repaired, a similar technique. Uh, two years and 10 months after operation, follow up MRI showed the, we can see the complete healing of a horizontal tear. Patient has a symptom disappeared. Uh, take home method is uh, medial meniscus posterior horizontal tear. The outcome after arthroscopic partial meniscectomy for degenerative uh, medial meniscus tears was not superior to conservative treatment or same surgery. ESCA recommended arthroscopic partial meniscectomies should not be proposed as a first line treatment. Surgical indication is depend on mechanical symptoms. So sometimes mechanical symptom is very difficult to identify. I think uh, so horizontal tears with flap tear or meniscal cyst on MRI is indicated for arthroscopic partial meniscectomy. Doing partial meniscectomy, I like to preserve peripherally is very important so to we can expect spontaneous healing. In younger patients, uh, arthroscopic uh, meniscal or inside the suture repairs will help for, to preserve the more meniscal tissues. Uh, so we should not uh, uh, throw away meniscus. We have to save the meniscus, which is well known. These pictures, uh, Professor Funga uh, gave me these pictures. We can see the JST, Chistan hospitals. We are deeply saddened by the news of uh, Professor Funga's death past. Uh, I think we keep, uh, we, either, we never forget uh, his uh, great achievement uh, in his scientific uh, work uh, and his contribution to our uh, society uh, in orthopedic field. Thank you very much for your uh, kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor An. Um, so, uh, uh, great talk. Uh, I'm pretty sure there are lots of very fundamental, important basic skills that all of us should learn from um, if we're going to do a meniscus surgery with good outcome. And also, once again, thank you very much for mentioning about uh, our uh, good friend, Professor Feng Hua. He did contribute a lot for the understanding of meniscus surgery in nature and all over the world. Thank you. I've dropped down some questions for you later on, okay? So we'll ask you in the Q&A section. So next one, uh, another Korean giant, uh, Professor Lee Sang Hak um, from the Kung He University, right? So um, Sang Hak has been with the ACAT group for many years, right? And today he's going to talk about the management of the ramp lesion of meniscus in ACL surgery. So Sang Hak, uh, please share your screen and start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Hello everyone, I'm Sang Yi from Seoul, Korea. My topic will be management of ramp reason in ACL surgery. Uh, this is my disclosure. Uh, as we know, the injury of peripheral attachment or posterior horn of medial meniscus is most commonly uh, combined with ACL distancy. The Dr. Strobel described this lesion as ramp region firstly. This region is concealed location from anterior portal. The MRI sensitivity is reported low. The particularly, uh, this is displacing during the flexion. That means uh, it has vertical motion. 
The prevalence of REM prison has been reported to range 9 to 17 percent. Recently, uh, the papers identified much higher rates up to 30 percent. This increase uh, are related the recent papers uh, performed uh, systematic isoscopy exploration with post-medial approaches. Uh, recently, we reported the instance of ramp region is 26.6%. Uh, 52 additional tears were identified via post-medial approaches. Uh, we published this paper entitled Increasing Incidence of Medial Medical Tears in Non-Operatively Treated HL Insufficient Patients. In our studies, the incidence of medial medical lesion is increased from 55% in first MRI to 84% in second MRI. At that time, AJSM uh, chief editor Bruce Ryder wrote in editorial, his friend Dr. Marshall the, uh, already published in 1971 the meniscus were invariably severely damaged. The medial meniscus usually more than the lateral in Asian deficient knee. We also published this paper entitled Ramp Reason in HDL deficient knee significantly influences anterior stability. The recent biomechanical studies also demonstrated the postmedial medial capsular sectioning significantly increases in both AP and rotational knee joint stabilities. So we are understanding the mechanism of lamp region in chronic ACL injuries, the increased anterior tibial translation and increased tibial slope may influence high stress loading on main capsular junction. Although we are understanding the lateral meniscus tear with ACL injury, we uh, exactly don't know the exact mechanism of ramp region in acute ACL injury. Uh, furthermore, the exact relationship between bone contusion in medial tibial plateau and ramp region is still controversial. Recently, we published the analysis of risk factor for lamp region. The significant risk factor for lamp region are bone contusion on posterior medial tibial plateau, chronic ACL injury, the steeper slopes, and more than three degrees bars alignment. This video uh, is from Dr. Sonia Kotet. We can see the injury mechanism of ACL and associated lesions. When the tibia is uh, anterior translation, the ACL and the lateral root tear can be developed, and tibia internal rotation, a tear is developed. When the knee is reduced, that time the medial femoral condyle the impinge to the medial tibial plateau. The width and membranous contraction, the ramp region, and posterior oblique ligament tear can be happened. The knee dislocation, the ACL, ALL, and then the ramp region. So now we are understanding the ramp region that can be developed in acute ACL injury with the contract curve injury mechanism, that means after the pivot shift injury. And the bars alignment is another uh, associated factor uh, with ramp region. The spontaneous healing of medial meniscus is uh, much higher than that of lateral meniscus. So many also recommended the active management with repair, even the stable medial meniscus tears. Let's see the cases. 17-year-old female patient, uh, MRI showed acute ACL and ramp region. 
but this patient uh, only received ACL reconstruction in local clinic. After six months, the ramp region is not healed. After three, after three years, the graft is healed well, but uh, medial meniscus buccal do is happened. Another case is a 39 year old male patient received ACL reconstruction two years ago. Uh, have pain in medial joint line, but followed up. After five months, the medial meniscus is buccal under tear. This is isoscope finding. The medial meniscus buccal under tear can be seen. The medial meniscus tear degeneration can be seen. Uh, this is view from posterior medial portal, longitudinal carry extended posterior medial. So all inside technique for long shear care of posterior horn and the inside out technique is performed and then the ACL division is also performed for this patient. This is follow-up MRI. The professor An introduced all inside main suture technique in 2004 and 2010 in famous journals. In his result, the meniscal healing rate is quite high, 97%. But incomplete healing is reported to 15%, especially at posterior medial corner. The conventional orifice suture technique is performed viewing from anterior portal, but that is difficult to repair at posterior medial corner. So posterior transeptal approach can be seen clearly at posterior middle corner like this. I will show case, 22-year-old male patient, acute ACL injury. In MRI finding, uh, ramp region is not definite. Uh, when you prove the main cause, quite stable. So we can see the small long strat here at posterior middle corner, but quite stable. The arthroscope is moved to the posterior medial compartment. We can see the long shell tear with hemorrhage. After changing 70 degree arthroscope, we can see the extended tear to the posterior medial uh, corner. So to see the extended posterior medial corner tear, so we made posterior transeptal portal. After uh, making the transeptal portal. The arthroscope is uh, moved to the uh, postlateral portal through the transeptal portal. The, we can see the long tear from posterior horn to the posterior medial corner. The tear is around the three centimeter. To repair the extended posterior medial corner tear, the, we made additional posterior medial portal, the observable suture PDS loaded 45 degree the suture is passed main scope first and then additional sutures passed capsule area and then uh, passed at once. I'd like to do the SMC sliding the time technique Edit half pages. This is first stitch. These two stitches uh, is finished by the additional postmedial portal, and the three more stitches is finished with the conventional postmedial portal. This is another case, chronic ACL injury, 19-year-old male patient. MRI looks normal, but we can see the complex tear in posterior horn of medial meniscus. Meniscus is displaced, uh, looks buccal tear. This is transeptal portal view. We can see the, the complex tear. Uh, I removed the small portion of meniscus, uh, changed it to the 70-degree arthroscope. I 
finished five stitches or inside suit technique. Uh, we can see the five stitches suture. Professor An showed modified suture technique for extended post uh, tear at post major corner. Uh, I did the five stitches. So as we know, because modern ACL reconstruction technique is not perfect, the careful diagnosis with systematic approach uh, and the aggressive treatment with all inside suture technique for ramp region uh, is recommended. So I want to see you at Pattaya. Mm, I'll meet Professor Feng. Rest in peace. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Hak Sang. Right. Um, so great talk uh, regarding the you know the tips in the ramp lesions um, in ACL surgery. Indeed, uh, as you mentioned, our great friend Feng Hua has a lot of research also in the ramp lesions over the past like six, seven years, right? Uh, with quite a lot of publications, right? Um, yeah. So. We'll come back to you for some of the questions. We have dropped down some questions for you, Hak San, San Hak, right? So okay. now we move on. Uh, we'll move on to our next speakers, um, Zhou Ho Wang, right, from Samsung Medical Centers, right? Uh, also a good friend in Asia, right? So he's going to talk about a difficult meniscus repair, dead or alive. I'm not sure what he's going to talk about, but let's listen to Zhou Ho, right? What's dead okay. or alive, right? Okay, thank you, Zhou Ho. Your turn, yeah. right? Okay. Good. Yeah, so can you hear me? Yes, beautiful. Yeah, so today I'm going to talk about the difficult cases. So I'm prepared the six cases. The most of cases about com uh, the flex tails. So this is my cases. Uh, first case is peripheral complex tail cases. So patient is a 15 year old male patient. He's a football player, so he has pain when he kicking. So, uh, uh, when you see the anterior horn of meniscus or mid body of meniscus, there is a complex tail, and meniscus with uh, the, the uh, dislocated peripherally. This is arthroscopic finding. Posterior horn and mid body looks okay, uh, and in a part of anterior horn is okay, but outer part of anterior horn you can see the complex tail. So it is difficult to repair. So I made a sub-meniscus, sub portal, and you can see the uh, displaced meniscus is reduced. What treatment, uh, what, what is your treatment option? So first, uh, I performed the meniscectomy at peripheral area. So the using shaver and also basket pose, uh, remove the, the abnormal ones. And we can uh, reduce the displaced meniscus. And suture hook is used, and vertical suture is placed using the suture hook. Uh, this part is upper part, this part is tibial side. And PDS suture is advanced. Low end of suture is pulled out through the sub meniscus portal. And meniscus is reduced and loop loaded the spinal lead is inserted and through the loop upper end of the suture is passed for the engagement. By pulling the loop and upper end of suture is pulled out. Uh, second suture is used and the suture loop inserted through the spinal lead and low end was engaged by pulling this loop and upper and lower end of suture is pulled outside of the joint. I uh, repeated this one five times and five suture can hold the inner side meniscus and peripheral displaced meniscus. And meniscus is reduced like that. And this is a preoperative MRI before surgery. After nine months, we performed MRI again. You can see meniscus is healed. There is no displaced meniscus here. This is a sagittal view. Also meniscus is healed, no displaced meniscus. 
the, this case, we can save the manuscripts. First the lesson from this case, complex tail of peripheral area can be successfully healed using modified outside technique after resection of bad tissues. Uh, second case is a combined tail, radial tail, and horizontal tail. Female 50-year-old patient, she has pain when he's walking. You can see the radial tail and also see horizontal tail and longitudinal tail, complex tail pattern. So I try to repair this uh, meniscus because patient age is uh, just 50 years old. You can see radial tail. What is your treatment option? I try to repair this one. So this is uh, the, I performed uh, side to side repair using all inside technique. This side, PDS, this side is a, another color stress used and short relay technique is used. And uh, SMC sliding knot tying is used and additional half hitch is applied. I thought this, this is not enough. So I decided to see the backside of the meniscus and add, added another suture through the posterior transept portal. This is viewed from the posterior medial portal and the suture is inserted through the posterior transept portal. Uh, promote he to promote healing, I used the fibrin club and also added another suture from the posterior medial portal. I did my best for this patient. But finally, uh, we cannot get healing of meniscus. There is big gap over here and there is here. What is the reason of uh, failure of meniscus? It is complex tail and there is degeneration. Patient age is relative option. What was the best uh, treatment for this patient? I think no, no surgery. <laughs> so I cannot save this meniscus here. Lesson from uh, this many cases, uh, no matter how good the technique was, there is no beneficial effect of the complex tail with degeneration in middle-aged patient. Third case, uh, complex tail, also there is radial tail and longitudinal tail. This is uh, the, the figure that shows the tail pattern of this patient. ACL was torn, and you can see the meniscus radial tail. Uh, this is view from the posterior medial, posterior retro portal. You can also see the longitudinal tail. I performed meni meniscus repair, the side to side repair using all inside suture technique. First, uh, using straight suture hook, the PDS was the inserted and lower end of PDS pulled out. Different color suture back zone is used and lower end of two, two sutures were pulled out and tied together and short relay techniques used. To avoid the soft tissue breach, it is uh, pulled out again and sliding that time is used. Is it enough? So I decide to backside again. Uh, Actual plan was I applied another all inside suture for the repair, the repair uh, of the longitudinal tail. But meniscus is too fragile, so this is an actual result. So I added the fast fix. Just to, there is no way to do for this patient except the fast fix. Uh, this is the final status of meniscus repair. So I performed second look arthroscopy 18 months later. ACA healed again, good, and the meniscus healed again. My repair was not good, but healing was good. This is index surgery, this is second surgery. Reason of a good healing, which are this patient is young and relative acute state, we can repair in acute state. ACA injury was done. We can save this patient. Even a poorly conducted repair could be helpful for the complex tail in severely damaged meniscus in young patient. First case, case that displaced the flat tail and properly cured meniscal fascicle tail. So 
the 17 year old patient, uh, torn meniscus was displaced to the behind the popliteus muscle. Concomitant ACL tear was done. I made a 3D imaging using this patient MRI. After radial tear, posterior part was displaced to the pop behind the popliteus muscle. So this is a posterior part of meniscus is displaced behind the popliteus. How can you reduce this one? So it is a diff difficult job for, for me at that time. So I used it. Uh, I applied the suture first, uh, after then PDL suture was passing through top to bottom and it is pulled out again okay, and spinal lead is inserted from the lateral side and lower end of suture is engaged and pulled outside of the joint and upper end of suture is pulled out again and finally we can reduce the meniscus to the front part of the popliteus muscle again after then we can perform the meniscus suture again After then, additional all inside suture for the side-to-side -side repair is used. First suture, and second suture, and tie it together. And PDL suture is both penetrated in anterior part of the torn meniscus to avoid the soft dish bridge, so pulled out, out again through the portal, and sliding that time is used. And I did another suture. From the front side, I did apply two more suture. Total three sutures used for the meniscus repair. After then, I go back to back side of the meniscus. Uh, this is view from the intercondylar lodge view. This is popliteus muscle. Capsule was detached from popliteus muscle. You can see that this is capsular side, meniscus side. This is popliteus side. Uh, you can see the. Uh, there is a tail, a popliteal meniscus fascicle tail. I performed, uh, repaired the popliteal meniscus fascicle. Uh, suture hook path through the capsular side first, pulled out through the portal, and second suture is passed through the pop popliteus muscle. So I tried to re repair the capsular side and the popliteus tendon. Uh, I, I'm using the, the and shuttle relay technique is used. Uh, capsular side is repaired to the popliteus muscle. After then, Second, I try to repair to the capsular side and meniscus side. First, the path through the capsular side first. After then, second suture passes pass through the, the meniscus side. This is the uh, meniscus there, and popliteal meniscus particle was repaired through this one. This popliteal tendon, meniscus, and capsular side. This is pre-operative MRI, this is post-operative MRI. So we can save this meniscus. Torn popliteal meniscus fascicle shouldn't be neglected and should be repaired in complex tail. This is a message from this one. So the, this case is a uh, radial uh, root tail and longitudinal tail is combined. You can see this displaced many flat tail. Uh, sometimes this torn flap was uh, uh, adhesive, adhesive, the, attached to the remnant ACA tissue. So it is sometimes it is displaced, displaced to the intercondylar notch. And so it is difficult, it is important to find this, this one. And the all inside suture is used and two stitches, two. All inside the suture, using this technique is used. 
After then, I go back to backside. Look at the backside. There is another longitudinal tail is here. Okay, this is view from the posterior retroporta, and there is a longitudinal tail here. Here, thirty degrees scroll, we cannot clear, clearly see, but seventy degrees scroll, you can clearly see longitudinal tail. So, also performed uh, the only side suture technique. This is a second of arthroscopic finding. H meniscus healed completely in the, from the anterior side. From the back side, also it is completely healed. So uh, the longitudinal tail is combined to uh, uh, a mass root tail. So longitudinal tail repair should be performed again. So I will briefly show the last case. There is a uh, horizontal tail is combined with incomplete longitudinal tail. This is horizontal tail finding. But in, inner side longitudinal tail is in, uh, the, the incomplete long, longitudinal tail is combined. So I performed many sectum here, inner side, and you can see the horizon incomplete longitudinal tail. So uh, I cannot repair the, I cannot use all inside tail technique because uh, we cannot see this the tail from the back side. So I use, just use past fix again. Uh, it looks so stable. For, for second look arthroscopic finding shows the, the past fix cut through the meniscus. So the meniscus tail was worsened. So I performed the meniscectomy again. Uh, I try to deliver six messages from my cases. Best basic principle of meniscus treatment is save the meniscus as much as possible. After then, we think we should think about meniscectomy and the meniscus transplantation again. But sometimes no treatment is best treatment for the patient. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Joe Ho. No treatment is the best treatment for patients. Uh, well, we need to think about it, right? It's, it's very mm -hmm. good. Um, so thank you very much for demonstrating beautiful cases. Uh, it's always good to learn from individual cases, right? Life or death, right? So uh, now we move on to, you know, after, you know, using a lot of effort to save the meniscus, right? Well, if it is like what Joe Ho has said, uh, that uh, finally you can't save it, then you need to replace it, right? So Jin Koo, uh, Professor J Kim Jin Koo, now he is the president, the president of the whole hospital, the Munji Hospital in Seoul, Korea. So uh, I would like to invite Professor Kim Jin Koo to talk about the clinical tips in meniscus allograft transplantation. Probably he is one of the pioneers and the most experienced people in the world, I would say. Yeah. Jin Koo. Thank you very much. So maybe uh, is it good? Yes, we can see that clearly, right? Uh, can you see this, uh, my presentation? Yes, we can see that. So I know we are, we are more than 20 minutes behind our schedule. So I will briefly uh, present my presentation regarding meniscus cellular transplantation. So I'm the member of International Meniscus Reconstruction Expert Forum. Every year, of course, we meet what's new in the meniscus transplantation, but until may pass the six, six years, there is nothing special, but still evolving. So I'm summarizing some um, current advances of meniscus transplantation. As you know, the, the meniscus deficient knee progressively make the degenerative changes. So if the meniscus function is absent, maybe we have some another biologic solution. Meniscus transplantation is one of the option, but meniscus transplantation, it's not the native meniscus. We have lots of problems to be solved. So, so, so 
I'm only focused on the technical tips for surgical tip. There is a two difference between open and arthroscopy. This is a very big surgery uh, with uh, some, I saw in the, in the one journal, they take out hold the MCL and every capsule and open up and then do the transplant and reconstruct everything. This open surgery is too big. So now we are now succeeded to develop arthroscopic techniques. So there is a cons the, the, the argument between the suture only fixation and the bony fixation because the lack of the meniscus transplant. So in European group, the only option should be the adjust the size and the suture only fixation because there is no enough meniscus transplant. So, but however, on the biomechanical study in the zero time, bone plug or bony fixation is much better in biomechanical terms in that, uh, it, the, the comparing to the soft tissue fixation. So the, if you use the soft tissue fixation, enough biologic healing time and, and uh, some biologic uh, the, the need be, uh, should be needed. The, another surgical tip, lateral side shows O shape, medial side C shape. So medial lateral side is much better to use bone bridge or together. So the combining whole anterior and posterior horn with bone, bone fix, fixation and then with the one block. However, the medial meniscus, there is a the anterior horn and posterior is far apart. Between two horns, there is a ACL insertion. So maybe maybe bony plug is much better than the bone uh, bridge method. So this is my first case of medial meniscus transplantation. Think about the result. Can I deliver this big bone plug into the posterior horn? Maybe the result is a disaster. So maybe I had a lesson. So. So reduce the posterior bony bone plug size or soft tissue graft or MCL release and the medial TBR spine is a critical uh, technical uh, tips to do the successful and very uh, easy medial meniscus transplantation. So now we use only very small bone shelf to the posterior side and the relatively bigger bone plug in the anterior side. So bone to bone healing and then promote the posterior, uh, uh, posterior passages and then, and then avoid many bone tunnel because the medial meniscus transplantation is uh, done with uh, combined with the ACL or PCL reconstruction. So reduce the, the bony tunnel is very important. So. I just make a bony hole here with a very small bone shell. This is my technique for, for the modification. Now I use this uh, flip cutter and some using the Arthrex device. So I will leave, leave it briefly. For the lateral side, the bone bridge technique is also very nice. So commercially available, uh, the guide is uh, now uh, everywhere. Every uh, uh, company supplies a commercially available device. Uh, I'm now using the, uh, the, the keyhole technique developed 20 years ago, but the result is pretty good. So I don't have any reason to change my technique. Instead of changing my technique, I use some modification of a custom developed some bone cheeser and some device to make some uh, easy uh, keyhole. So beveling of posterior side is very important to prevent the cut of the meniscus transplant. And using this uh, suture device and the retriever, I only use only one anterior uh, uh, incision, reduce the lateral incision. So, so MCL release in the medial side and the step cut release of the lateral collateral ligament is very important to open up the working space in the medial or lateral, very tight compartment. 
So don't hesitate to release this, uh, uh, this, uh, this ligament to open up the working space to reduce your uh, operating time and protect the cartilage. It's an uh, important thing. For the problem is uh, graft extrusion. So uh, as we experience the graft extrusion, although we make a very perfect operation, during the surgery. So after the surgery, the meniscus is not there. So still gradually extrude it. So maybe, uh, maybe over 42% 40, extrusion in Professor Song Il Bin and another reported more than 90% extrusion. I reported 80% extrusion more than uh, three millimeters. However, until now, no consensus of clinical effect of clinical uh, great uh, graft extrusion, but the the degree of extrusion is uh, uh, related to the degree of degenerative changes uh, in the long term. So this is a very excellent report from Professor Bean. So it's the extruded group shows uh, the relative joint space narrowing. So maybe until the long term. So we should reduce the graft extrusion. So how to reduce the graft extrusion is the, as, is the big issue. Professor, Professor Monroe uh, shows the capsulodesis because the meniscus extrusion or deficient meniscus, the capsule is redundant and very lax. So after we uh, transplant the meniscus, we reduce this capsular laxity to, to repair back the capsule like a capsulodesis. Another one, uh, some, the Hideki Koga reported the centralization that they pass the, the suture anchor through the capsule, not through the meniscus. And uh, then the, the similar capsulodesis like uh, uh, Professor Mono. Uh, this is his cases. So another one is a very very uh, anatomic uh, bone trough method is very important. The medialization of the bone trough, tight graft, lateralization make very loose graft. So maybe anatomic centering of the graft of the tunnel is very important. So make every effort to, to make this uh, uh, bone block, you should uh, uh, you should uh, uh, spend your time. This is the most important procedure of the meniscus transplant. So position of the bone breach is closely related to the extrusion. And another one is if you select both the bigger one or sh uh, sh smaller one in the anatomic uh, range, within two millimeters, I always select a smaller one to reduce the extrusion. This is a statistically important. Another one is to think of the slope. The slope is not posterior seven degrees in the lateral. This is medial. Lateral side, about 15 degrees of anterior, anterior slope. So the anatomy of uh, the lateral bony slope is like that. So the, the, the follow the MRI slope like this. Never follow this uh, with the CM in the lateral transplantation. So reducing the size, is I can uh, reduce this uh, uh, meniscus extrusion and make the cast for three weeks and then unloading brace for three months definitely reduce this uh, extrusion. So maybe rehabilitation I'm becoming very conservative between uh, uh, comparing to the past. So, so maybe I experienced it for, until now for 500 cases of transplantation. If there is uh, any chances, let's share our experience. I show my sincere condolences uh, uh, for Professor uh, Fong Hua. I will uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jinku, um, for the great talk on the meniscus allograft transplantation. I understand that not in every part in Asia we can have this meniscus allograft, but um, 
Well, I've seen your beautiful surgery before, and so I'm pretty sure if anyone wants to develop uh, this meniscus allograft transplantation technique in your own regions and countries, go to Korea. They, a lot of them are doing very good work, right? And, and also thanks for addressing um, the, our good friends, Professor Fung Hua, right? Now, um, we come to the Q&A sections. China Khan and I have collected uh, some questions um, I just want every one of you uh, to unmute your mic. I mean, for, for all the panelists, all the five panelists to unmute your mic. So um, we have selected a few questions. So any one of you can try to answer. Uh, because of shortage of time, uh, we want to concentrate on a little bit of those technical tips, right? Number one, probably uh, whoever can answer, right? About the tips of releasing the MCL in repairing the middle meniscus, tight middle joint eye, right? So, um, Sachin, you mentioned about that. Would you like to start first, right? Yeah, so I think there are a couple of ways you can release the MCL. And the first statement I'd like to make is that a lot of people are scared that if they do a pie crusting of the MCL, the patient will land up with the valgus instability of the knee. That is never the case because this is always a controlled procedure. There are two ways you can do this. If you're doing a concomitant ACL reconstruction and you're harvesting a hamstrings graft, you have the superficial MCL, which is right there in front of you. And then you can take a sharp periosteal elevator and elevate the superficial MCL very adequately and very properly, as ben has been shown by Professor uh, Jingu as well in his uh, presentation. If you're not going to be doing any incision on the anteromedial aspect of the tibia, say like in an ACL reconstruction, then the other way you can do it is to hold the knee in near full extension, about 20, 10 to 15 degrees of flexion, give a valgus stress, palpate the joint line, and either go proximally around the area between the medial epicondyle and the gastrocubricle, or you can go distally, just on the posterior medial aspect of the joint line. You can feel the fibers of the superficial MCL, and then with an 18 gauge needle, you can scratch them and the medial side will open up. So those will be my techniques to do a controlled pie crusting of the medial side. Sachin, Sachin, you mentioned yeah. about doing one in the proximal and one in the uh, beneath the meniscus. Which one do you prefer? So it actually depends upon the amount of correction yeah. that I want to do. If you want to get a larger form of larger form of opening, I prefer to do the proximal one because I feel that it addresses both the POL as well as the um, superficial MCL. If I want to do less of an opening, I try to go distal below the joint line uh, on the posterior corner of the tibia. Good. Thank you, Sachin, right? Thank you. Uh, first case, question is about the rehab. We, we have changed. Yeah, Joe Ho, you, I want to ask you this question. People ask about the rehabilitation with change. Yeah. Okay, so just repair, right? So can you, you Anyway, protection is necessary because of meniscus healing, because we usually perform meniscus repair. Anyway, so MCL heal faster than the meniscus. So no additional protection is necessary for the pycrostin. This okay. is my answer for that. Thank you very much, Ray. Well, uh, maybe the other question is uh, for um, uh, maybe Professor Lee and, and also Professor An, you may like to answer this, right? People ask about if you're repairing the lateral meniscus. Someone will say that if they always go from the front, not from the back, right? How can we avoid the propitious tendon? Can you fix with the propitious tendon or you always spare it, right? Okay. Yeah, uh, Professor Lee or Professor An, right? The propitious tendon, right? What do you think? Do you always spare it, try to avoid it, or you think the suturing of the electromagnesis with the propitious is not a problem? Yeah, can I, can I say first? Yeah, yeah, Joe Hong. Yeah. yeah, so I, I show the repair of the propitious tendon to the capsule and meniscus. So yeah. uh, there is an over constraint of the meniscus attached to the propitious tendon, but we use the observable suture. So there is a uh, it is uh, safer to to avoid the uh, uh, the using the uh, observable suture. Okay, so, yeah. I, I agree with Professor Wang's opinion. So 
observable suture is very important because uh, the, the, the fixation of the meniscus, maybe the popliteal hiatus is uh, become normal. So if we use the non-observable suture, this motion is blocked. So observable suture maintained until meniscus healing is very important strategies. Okay, so I think the tips is that I think about the usage of the sutures, absorbable sutures will be ideal, especially around that region, not to fix directly to the palpitus tendon. Yeah. Am I right? Right? Good. So, um, Patrick, Patrick, yeah, yeah. Patrick, no, okay. there's, there's one question from the, the audience that they ask uh, if you have very tight uh, lateral compartment, how uh, would the expert deal with that? Can tight anyone share that? Compartment, right? Middle side, yes. you release the MCL, tight lateral compartment. Anyone? It's very important, a very difficult situation. I always meet in the, during the lateral meniscus transplantation. So I always uh -huh. open up the lateral side along the lat lateral collateral ligament and make some pie crust, including the posterior lateral capsule. So this space gradually open up, not so satisfactory, but this is enough to do the transplantation. So be, uh, uh, be patient. So make some very, uh, using the 18 gauge needle and making some pie crust. So three or four times and then make virus and then three or four more make virus, including LCR and the lateral, posterior lateral capsule. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um... One question for Professor Ahn, right? Um, quite a number of uh, attendees asked about the technique of the transportal technique, right? Posterior transportal technique for repair. Can you just quickly simplify the important tips to them? Posterior transeptal potars, uh, if you make a, a proper Potter to the posterior medial and the posterior lateral potter. And looking from posterior medial potter, a switching stick is equipped to the posterior lateral potter. The switching stick is pushed from posterior lateral potter to medially. Uh, we can uh, very nicely the posterior capsule. Kept, uh, behind the PCL of a posterior capsule, they are very safe. There are no dangerous structure. So we can make cross the hole at the, the just the posterior to the PCL, as we call this posterior transeptal portal, you can make it safely. During making posterior uh, transeptal portal, you should not damage the posterior capsule. If you damage the posterior capsule, it's the uh, popliteal artery vessel is very close to there. Uh, so uh, I, like, um, I, I like to emphasize uh, you should not to damage the posterior capsule, it is very important. So if you're working to anterior to posterior capsule in central portion is very safe. You can uh, make a posterior transeptal portal is no problem. And after uh, making posterior transeptal portal, the second arthroscope we uh, performs, the hole is uh, spontaneously healed. So there are no problems uh, to make posterior transeptal portal. Okay. Thank you, Professor Ahn. Very clear. Right? I hope the attendees will we will be able to do that, right, and, and, and learn from all these tips, right? Well, Jinku, um, yes. well, I don't think uh, this question you can answer within like one minute, but people ask about how to start the allograft bank in your region, right? But I think uh, you probably can answer in the Q&A box personally because of time, right? Last question to all of you, right? Uh, whoever answers, right? People ask about radial tear, right? how to enhance the healing of the radial tear. Anyone? Uh, so I'd like to answer that the radial tear. Radial tear is a very frequently uh, occurred in lateral meniscus mid body. It's a, radial tear is a very, onset is less than three months. We can repair, uh, repairable, but in chronic radial tear, is the meniscus substance is disappeared. So if you do possible repairs, the meniscus is more damaging. So it's a, in, on also incomplete radial tears, uh, I think we don't need to repair, but the complete tear in a relatively uh, acute or subacute stage is we can do repairable. 
and I like to use the pairs with the spinal leader in approximation through outside in and the horizontal uh, repair and also vertical repair is all inside the shooter technique. These are two different planes. Repair is a more uh, rigid uh, fixa fixations. And after repairs, uh, weight bearing is a delayed weight bearing. So I think it's very important. If you allow the two earlier or partial weight bearing, maybe more damage to the repair site. Okay, good. Maybe clutch working is a partial weight bearing is uh, six weeks. That's I, okay, I, I so the rehabilitation is also very yeah, more than six months. Yeah, thank you, Professor yeah. An, right? Can so, I answer briefly for the tissue bank? Yeah, okay, okay, good. 11 years ago, Korean government established the law for the tissue bank. So it's up to the, the government thing. And then, unfortunately, Korean people never donate their whole body to the public. So it, uh, we have a, make a law to import our graft from America and everywhere. And then Korean CDC uh, establishes the safety law, safety uh, uh, guideline to import to the, our tissue. So most of my practice is the graft, the, uh, the tissue tissue is from American tissue bank, and okay. the posterior lateral capsule pie crust, just the posterior to the LCR. Maybe we make I make some eleven blades some, with some three or four or four uh, steps, very very short steps. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Jingu. So um, sorry because of time, uh, we cannot go further for the Q and A sections. But uh, if you have left some questions um, on the Q&A box, uh, uh, the, our panelists will try the very best to answer that, right? So before we conclude, uh, first of all, um, China Khan, right? You want to announce something, right? So- um, Yes. Do you see my screen now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, our, uh, good evening, everyone. So I would like this, to use this opportunity to share the, uh, the next meeting. Even we know the COVID situation is not quite settled yet, but we have to move forward. So the meeting of EPCAS this year is still planned in December on the 3rd to the 3rd, uh, the same place in Pattaya in Thailand, which is about uh, one hour from the uh, airport, one and a half hour. Uh, besides the main meeting uh, on the very first day, uh, no, one day before on the 2nd of December, we plan to have the uh, uh, pre-congress symposium, which is going to deal with the massive irreparable elepar calf repair. We're going to have uh, Teru Mihata, Basim Al Hassan, and Pascal Boyro, who will share their expertise there. And with uh, our main uh, meeting, we will have uh, live surgeries and cardiac demonstrations. I believe six of them, and many keynotes, lecture, and workshops. As you can see, this is the highlight of the meetings. And Pattaya is a, is a very nice city, uh, very welcome for the toilets to join. You can bring your families. Uh, I know we have time, so the deadline is not yet finished. We extend the deadline to the August 31st this year. So it's quite uh, three, four months. So we will see, uh, you still can submit the, uh, your uh, abstract on the website. As you can see, web appcast 2020org Good. Some information. Thank you very much. And uh, you, uh, hope we can have this. Well, we, we still have time. I'm pretty sure we can uh, go through this COVID-19 and come and meet together, right? Now, um, I want to promote a little bit about the next webinar, which will uh, supposed to be in three weeks' times, right? Uh -huh. I have to let you know that uh, our very good friend, Professor Fong Hua, has been planning this webinar regarding patella instability with me since a couple of weeks ago, right? Uh, initially, he, he, he also planned to join us tonight. But now, um, this, is, this is what we show is the tentative program. Uh, since Professor Feng Hua cannot join us, I've already invited his senior fellows to join us uh, to show the great work for Professor Feng Hua. So please remember this day, 12th of June, exactly three weeks from now, Friday evening, okay? Um, so 
And then we have a Professor Nobu Adachi, Professor Yong, uh, Professor Chen Yishan, as well as Professor James Hoi, with myself and Dave to moderate, right? This session is on patella instability, right? I hope all of you, all the attendees can join us to show the respect and the great support to Professor Feng Hua, uh, all the friends from Jisui Tan Beijing Hospital, as well as the families of Professor Feng Hua, right? To send our salute to them, right? So with that, uh, I would like to thanks all the speakers, uh, Professor An, Jinku, Shang Hak, Zhou Ho, Xia Qin, and my good brother, Chana Khan, to help me to moderate the sessions. Uh, of course, uh, we need to thank all the APCAS uh, uh, secretaries and technical staff supporting this webinar, right? Um, Chana Khan, any works? Well, uh, nothing much. Uh, I, I think this is the actually that we can do. I know we can't have a face-to-face -face meeting. So I believe this is something we can connect everyone together. So please support our next meeting and uh, we will keep seeing each other at least like this, okay? Okay, before we end, um, to say our, uh, our respect to uh, Professor Song Wah, as requested by some of the other uh, friends, I want to show the video of Professor Feng Wah again before we conclude this um, webinar, right? We got it. Great friends, our great brother, scholars, um, Lee Giants, Malaysia. So, um, our salutes and remembrance to uh, Feng Hua. Okay, so uh, see all of you in three weeks' time um, um, for the Patella Instability webinars, right? Uh, we will continue the spirit of Feng Hua to promote uh, healthy needs uh, uh, for all our Asian friends. Thank you. Thank you, Chanakan. Thank you, all the speakers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.